Hey, greetings. Thanks for joining me. It's uh, Fred Alaska here. Ah, get that camera fixed a little bit there. Uh, Want to give a shout out to Rick Souther. Thanks for the hat, buddy. Appreciate it. Um, Want to give a shout out to Sweden, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Philippines, all, all those foreign countries that join us here. Appreciate you. Um, I'm going to be posting some pictures from Sweden uh, sent by a viewer to the website here as soon as I get them to my tech guy. <laughs> what I wanted to share with you guys today is uh, really, really creepy stuff. Um, I was contacted by a guy I grew up with. Uh, we'll, we'll say his name's Joe. Um, before talking to him and his son yesterday, uh, I hadn't talked to him since like 2007. Last time I was in Dillingham. So he'd been following the channel and stuff and has been aware of the hairy man all, all his life. Uh, never had any experiences until what I'm about to share with you. So from what him and well, his son will call Joe Jr. Um, this started back when Joe Jr. was four years old. They were at fish camp. And at that time, his mother-in-law, Joe's mother-in-law, was still alive and was keeping an eye on Joe Jr. And at fish camp, you know, it gets busy. They're, they're doing their thing, processing fish. They're, they're keeping some, taking the rest to market, etc. And uh, we'll just say this, this happened in Bristol Bay. So Dave, the tech guy, just like pin this one in Ecock or something like that. Uh, not where this happened, but just pin it there. He wants to keep anonymity and doesn't want anyone coming around fair enough <laughs> so grandma would watch Joe jr. and you know uh, Joe started noticing Joe jr. talking about the man the man over there always waving at me and they would look around and there was other people but they were further down the beach or further up the beach no one immediately by him so he figured eh, just the imagination of a kid you know imagining someone waving at him so the season you know, continues on and he would hear little remarks from Joe Jr. about the man waving to him. And there was a couple of hairy men waving to him. So, you know, just conversation and passing, being tired from fishing, he never took much stock in it, just imagination of a four-year-old. Following year, uh, it goes about the same. Yeah, little random things Joe Jr. would say about that man keeps waving at me to come over there or this and that. And grandma started picking up on it and started paying more attention. And so what she did was she would go and pray a blessing just in a perimeter. She would walk back and forth and say prayers and, you know, uh, basically putting up a spiritual type of fence around their area. And, you know, it went on like that for a couple of years with these random things of Joe Jr. talking about, they wave at me, they want me to come and, and, and play with them. And they would ask, you know, oh, well, you know, what do you mean play with them? I don't, and, and Joe Jr. never had an answer. He just shrugged like, I don't know. I, I didn't go play with them, so I didn't know what they wanted. They thought it was odd, but chalked it up to imagination of a child, you know, until... Um, a couple years back, uh, his mother-in-law passed away. And uh, so his wife's sister took over the job of watching the young in while they were doing the set netting and all this kind of thing, right? And that first season with Grandma Pass, it was, it was hard on all of them because she was such an integral part of what they did. And, and so it, it was hard on all of them. Uh, but what one thing that didn't stop is Joe Jr. at this time now uh, once grandma passed or whatever he was about six years old uh, and a lot more talkative a lot more sophisticated in his speech and he started telling his auntie hey there's a hairy man over there who keeps calling me over to play and he says I'll go over but as soon as I get to where grandma used to walk they back, they back away from that area. They don't come past that area, but they keep trying to get me to come outside of where grandma walked. <laughs> and the aunt at first was like, well, you shouldn't be playing back there or whatever. You stay over here where we can see you. And he, you know, no one was listening to Joe Jr. So he just kind of was like, all right, left it alone. 
So, the following year, something big and brown was spotted behind their camp. And it was spotted by his wife and his, uh, her sister. And it was while Joe and Joe Jr. were getting some supplies from Dillingham. And they, they were gone all day, but the two ladies noticed something big and brown moving in the back in the tall sawgrass and stuff before the uh, black spruce trees started. And they're armed, you know, they're not ignorant. You know, there's big bears around there. They want the salmon too. So <laughs> they, they chalk it up, let Joe know when he gets back. So that whole season before this last year, where everything came to a head, the, the season before that, just a couple years ago, uh, Joe Jr. was about seven years old. And he tells his dad, that little one over there keeps asking me to come outside of where grandma used to walk. They said they can't come past that. And Joe Jr. had no idea what was going on. But the grandma used to walk and pray in a semicircle around the camp to to ward off evil spirits, right? So <laughs> he tells Joe Jr., uh, well, then you, you make sure you stay within where they won't come. Never go past that. You always stay over here. Never follow anyone you don't know. You know, just, just the basic stuff. And still at the time wasn't, wasn't giving it a whole lot of... Uh, it, it just, he chalked it up as the imagination of a child still. You know, because at seven, he, you know, he was just, maybe it's just this imaginary friend thing. And he's just, you know, not quite let go of it yet. But it sparked Joe's interest enough to where he kept a regular eye when he could, when he wasn't busy with the set net and the tides and all that kind of stuff, and, and surveying the area. So, one morning, that same season, uh, Joe was up early, and Joe Jr. got up with him. And they were outside, and he was tending, he was mending some of the holes in the net and whatnot. And Joe Jr. says, oh, he's asking me to come play. And he goes, who are you talking about? He goes, the, the little one, the little, the little hairy person over there. So Joe turns around, looks, and sure enough, there's a brown, he couldn't make it out from where they were sitting, but there's a brown spot within the grass and it, it moved away. So he immediately thinks bear. He tells Joe Jr. get inside the shack. Now, runs him inside. Joe Jr.'s in the safe place with his auntie and his mom. He grabs the shotgun, or I apologize, uh, 300 Win Mag rifle, and runs out into the grass and runs out looking for any sign of this, what he thought was a bear. He thought his son was equating these brown things to bears. So he runs out there, sees nothing, sees a little bit of a what could be construed as something moving through the grass, but there was nothing definitive. He couldn't find any tracks. There was impressions in the ground, but he, he was taking any impressions as a double bear track, you know, so he let it go. <laughs> Chalked it up to the mind of a child equating a bear to a person wanting to play with him. So he goes inside. He says, hey, you don't you don't talk to bears. When you see the bears, you you let us know immediately. And, and Joe Jr. is a little confused. He goes, what? There was no bear. There was a little, little hairy person over there. He goes, chastises his son and says, don't follow the bears. Don't think that they're your friends. Bears will eat you, you know, goes through the whole spiel. Until the following year, uh, they had just gotten to camp and he was waiting for his wife and her sister to show up uh, friends of theirs were dropping them off in a different skiff and him and Joe jr. Were getting the net and the gear out and stuff and checking their drag line and stuff and they had a four-wheeler there And you know, they were just doing getting camp set up stuff Well, Joe jr. Asked if he could play where he had this little dirt pile and some of his toys right on the back side of the shack and, and Joe said yeah, you just stay there and You know watch out for bears and you know let me know if you see a bear you come over and let me know so some time goes on joe's doing his thing he's mending a net he's stacking it getting it ready for setting and you know when the opener comes and everything and uh he's distracted by the skiff coming up 
to drop off his wife and her sister. So his attention's on that, and then he hears Joe Jr. scream. Turns around and looks, and Joe Jr.'s beelining it straight to him, and he looks past Joe Jr. into the grass and sees this brown thing again moving away. And so at this point, he's he's had he's gonna shoot and kill this bear this bear is obviously a problem it keeps coming back is how joe views it joe grabs 300 wind mag and goes after tells joe wait for your mom and stuff he, he kind of mills around for a few minutes till they get to shore make sure that an adult has eyes on joe jr tells him hey i gotta go there was a bear the guy that brought the wife and aunt to drop them off goes with joe they both beeline the same direction where Joe seen this brown bear move. They, they follow the trail in the grasses and then it gets off into the tundra and then over to the black spruce and stuff. And so they get to that point and Joe is immediately nervous and the friend, the family friend that was with him gets really nervous as well. Um, starts telling Joe, hey, this, this doesn't feel right. There, there's something off about this. This don't feel right. Joe was like, yeah, I feel what you're talking about, but I can't have this bear killing my family, you know, on, not on my watch kind of kind of attitude about it, which I totally understand. And so <laughs> while I, I could tell this really bothered Joe because when we were sitting there, uh, we, we had basically brunch together yesterday, me, Joe, and Joe Jr. So I, I heard this from them individually, you know what I mean? Um, just yeah, okay let, let me just finish so as they were standing there uh, he said he guessed made about 40 yards away about 40 yards away inside the tree line out of their view they heard movement and Joe goes stay here uh, his friend that followed him just carried a uh, 357 and a shoulder holster his friend had that out Little, little small one, little four inch barrel, 357. Uh, basically noise maker for bears to chase bears off. Uh, only reason the guy had it. So he pulls his 357 and Joe goes the direction just outside of the tree line in the direction that he's hearing these noises of this bear. He gets about 30 yards away from his friend who is standing in the same spot. He gets about 30 yards down and starts cutting into the trees because the movement stopped. So Joe, it opened up a little more in the black spruce and stuff. So where he felt a little more comfortable getting in there, he wanted to kill this bear. So he makes his way back, he said about 15 feet. And as he was moving, he noticed something big and brown up above these trees. And these trees were seven, eight foot tall. <laughs> so something brown catches his attention. He looks up. And he said this thing was looking at him over the top of these trees that were right in front of him. And he said he was holding the rifle and looking up and he was trying to register what he was seeing. Uh, he said it had a real wrinkled face, uh, not a conical head, more like a, a big round head. Uh, almost looked like a, a woolly uh, hood over around because the hair was just in a big ring. It was an ash gray colored skin, super, super wrinkly, pitch black eyes. Uh, nose flat to the face, real broad, looked almost like uh, from where he could see it, it kind of cut off where the chin would be, but he could tell the lower part of the head was a lot wider than what he was looking at, and, and he was stuck for a moment. Uh, when we were talking yesterday, and I was asking him, you know, if you can remember the details, uh, he said he didn't take his eyes off of it, and he was fumbling with the safety on his rifle. He wanted to get the safety off, and, and shoot this thing and I asked him I was like well what were you thinking during this this part of it I, I was like I understand you were you know emotional you know startled he said he didn't know what to think about it and that uh, something within him was telling him to leave uh, he said it wasn't mind speak or anything like that but he was he was feeling very very small and understandably i mean he's about 15 feet from these trees and this thing is standing up over them looking at him so he starts backing up a little bit clicks the safety off because he's not wanting to take his eyes off of this thing and he quickly tries to pull the rifle up and as he does so just this thing takes off in a flash right 
So as soon as it takes off away from him, he turns around and heads away from it. Clears the tree line, gets back out, whereas, you know, the the guy he knew that brought his family or whatever, his, his wife and uh, sister-in-law was standing there. <laughs> that person saw what he saw from a different vantage point. He was looking that direction, but he saw what Joe did from its side profile. So Joe went down about 30 yards and then cut in, made it in maybe 15 feet or so. It just so happened this guy saw this thing on all fours through the trees, broken up of course as it was moving, and then stood up and looked down at Joe. And he's, he told Joe, he goes, I was gonna shoot it, but I was scared it would upset it and it would kill you. He said, once, once he, from his friend's point of view, when he pointed the gun at it, was the exact same time that Joe pointed the gun at it and it moved. So he thought, okay, I scared it away for Joe, but it was just a coincidental thing. <laughs> so they immediately beat feet back to the camp. Uh, the friend said, hey, I'm out of here. You guys be safe and, and, and gets out of Dodge. After a few minutes of conversation with the wife and the sister-in-law and stuff. And then everything that Joe Jr. had been telling him about for years prior all had a totally different meaning. So with Joe's permission, with him sitting there, I asked Joe Jr., what kind of things would they tell you? How did you know they were talking to you? He said that they would whisper to him when his grandma wasn't paying attention and tell him to come outside of that area where his grandma had prayed that ring of protection. Uh, I asked him, did you ever go outside of it? He said, no, I, I always, I, I didn't trust them. I said, did they want to did they tell you they wanted to be your friend he said no they just said they couldn't play with me unless i came outside of that area and so i left him alone for a minute because i didn't want him to uh i didn't want to feed him anything you know what i mean i wanted it, his reactions to be organic so me and joe talked a little bit more and joe said after his buddy left uh they closed ranks um he, he was really, really nervous. Uh, he had a different set net sight um, that he was gonna make use of, but he was thinking about doing it the following year. But instead, they picked up and started packing things up and stuff and, and moved to a different set net sight. Now, Joe Jr., after he, you know, Joe got done telling me about the move and all that and, you know, the, the petty arguments and whatnot and the changing of the permit, whatever, whatever. <clears throat> Registering the permit. So, we get back to Joe Jr. and I ask him, was there anything else they tried to tell you or say to you? And all he would say, and, and I didn't, again, I didn't want to feed him anything. I wanted it to be organic. Uh, all Joe Jr. would say was, is that these things would not come past where his grandma used to walk. And so I left it at that. I, I, he was a sweet kid. I didn't want to pressure him. I, I didn't want it to be anything. I, I didn't want him to feel like he had to answer anything or just tell me something just to tell me. Um, I try to keep it organic and uh, I want to thank Joe For sharing that with me. Uh, he is planning on going back to the old set net site. Uh, he may uh, Within the next few days and uh, what is it Thursday? Something like that. I don't even know the freaking date. Hold on a second here. Oh It's Thursday May 11th, so uh, he'll, he'll be back in that area by the 15th. I would I would assume he's gonna check out the area and do a little better investigating. I told him if he thought about it, send me some photos or whatever. Um, I'd like to uh, check it out if there's anything interesting or worthwhile. You know, uh, I want to thank Joe for one um, coming and talking to me about it, having brunch with me. I appreciate it. Um, I want to thank Joe Jr. for for being brave enough to share what he did. Very little, but uh, the one thing that stood out is. As a little kid, innocent as hell, he instinctively, I, I asked him if, if he was scared of them or if 
they if he was friendly with them and his words were my grandma said never trust them and I asked him to elaborate and he just kind of trailed off on some stuff so I let it alone but that stood out to me he I was glad to hear that he listened to his grandma and uh, again I'm gonna thank Joe I'm gonna thank Joe jr. and uh, I'm gonna thank you guys for joining me uh, Borealis Bigfoot Conference, June 10th and 11th, Fairbanks Carlson Center, uh, BorealisBigfoot.com. I think you can get the tickets are at the Carlson Center. Uh, Beans and them didn't give me too much information about the ins and outs. Uh, they didn't spell my name right on the flyer either, Beans. Beans. And uh, anyway, I don't want to get into that stuff. But um, thank you guys for joining me, and we'll catch you on the next one.